America's Town Meeting is on the air. Welcome to Historic Town Hall in New York City and to a free and unrehearsed discussion of the question, should we limit the rights of political groups with alien ties? Our moderator is Mr. George V. Denny, Jr., President of Town Hall, Founder and Director of America's Town Meeting of the Air, Mr. Denny. Good evening, neighbors. Our question tonight might better be phrased, except for its length, how can a liberal democracy with freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom of assembly protect itself against the aggressive tactics of a militant totalitarianism, which by its very nature seeks to do away with these liberties and has openly avowed its antagonism to our form of government? You will see that this problem, however phrased, goes right to the heart of American democracy. How elastic ought our Bill of Rights to be? If we suspend its provisions, do we not deprive ourselves of the very liberties we are striving to protect? Article 2 of the Bill of Rights forbids us to infringe the rights of people to keep and bear arms. Does that obligate us to let the Nazi buns in our midst bear arms, wear uniforms, and drill? Are we safer in permitting the communists to publish doctrines inspired by Moscow than we would be in driving their activities underground? Is it enough merely to expose the sources of the various propagandas? In short, how liberal can we afford to be in dealing with those to whom the very word liberal is a term of abuse in some parts of the world? To discuss this question this evening on Town Hall's platform, we have three Americans of widely differing views. Dr. Harold D. Laswell of the W.A. White Psychiatric Foundation of Washington, political scientist who has made studies of the effects of propaganda in Germany, Italy, and Russia. Congressman J. Parnell Thomas, a member of the House of Representatives from New Jersey and vice chairman of the Dyes Committee, and Mr. Jerome Frank, attorney and author of a book called Save America First, also a member of the Securities and Exchange Commission. At this time, I take pleasure in presenting our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Harold D. Laswell, now visiting Sterling Professor at the Yale Law School. Dr. Laswell. We are talking about this question because many American citizens believe that democracy has been too tolerant in the past. They say that it is all very well to talk about democratic tolerance. There's a point where hospitality stops and suicide begins. There is no debate here among Americans about the desirability of preserving and fulfilling democracy. We're determined that democracy in America shall not go down to defeat under the subversive attacks of political groups with anti-democratic ties. We can learn something from the experience of other democratic nations in the defense of democracy. In particular, we have something to learn from the tragic weakness of democratic Germany in the face of the Nazi menace. The National Socialist Movement assaulted German democracy by acts of incitement and by anti-democratic propaganda. The National Socialist Movement put its youth in uniform and substituted the rhythm of the marching boot for freedom of discussion. They organized the youth in military formations as a means of spreading terror. The Nazis took full advantage of the uncertainty and confusion of the German Democrats. The German democracy was not able to draw a line between incitement and propaganda. The Hitler movement covered its tracks by shrewdly keeping within the forms of legality. In the name of legality, they were busy digging the grave of German democracy. German Democrats wanted to keep free speech, but in fact they put up with free incitement. They were slow, weak, and unstable. When they finally made it illegal to wear party uniforms, they failed to abolish the private military formations. After the overthrow of democracy in Germany, defensive measures against the wearing of party uniforms were taken in democratic Sweden, Denmark, and Norway in 1933. Today, all the democratic countries of Europe have passed laws prohibiting the assembly of men in uniformed shirts. Even Great Britain adopted a stiff public order act in 1936. It is time to ask ourselves just how necessary is a colored shirt to free discussion. Red, 
brown, blue, or black shirts have never been an aid to the pursuit of truth in public. The shirt fronts, whether united or not, are acts of incitement that menace freedom. And democracy already has its hands full with the stuffed shirt front. <laughs> Hitler's National Socialists... Hitler's National Socialists made a farce of free discussion by acts of incitement. We should not hesitate to protect the integrity of public discussion in America against acts of incitement. But the protection of democracy needs to go much further. The National Socialist Movement undermined democracy in one of the most vehement propaganda campaigns in all history. They vilified the public men of the German nation. They insulted the birth and history of the Weimar Republic. They made hateful slogans of each year of the German Republic. 12 years, 13 years, 14 years of political shame, they said. Most fundamental of all, they attacked the basic ideas of democracy. Democracy is majority rule joined to a positive idea of justice. The positive idea is respect for the capacity of every individual to contribute to the life of the community. Every individual can contribute regardless of sex, race, or creed, and we assert his right to do so. To advocate violence is undemocratic. To deny rights to individuals because of race or creed is undemocratic. When confronted by anti-democratic propaganda, democracy is in a dilemma. We must take the risk of tolerating anti-democratic propaganda if we remain loyal to the principles of democracy. We have already made clear that democracy cannot wisely tolerate incitement. Let it be equally clear that if democracy must endure anti-democratic propaganda, it must meet anti-democratic propaganda with positive propaganda. When democracy is attacked, there should be prompt defense of democracy. If anti-democratic propaganda is circulated on the air, it is only fair to demand that the same amount of time shall be used immediately thereafter to answer attacks on democracy. If anti-democratic propaganda material is circulated in print, it is only fair that it shall be labeled subversive and shall include authoritative replies. If anti-democratic appeals are made at public meetings, the audience is entitled to an immediate defense of democracy, and it is the duty of the defenders of democracy to give that defense. This may be called the instant reply plan of democratic defense. For instance, if anti-democratic groups buy time over the air, wouldn't it be fair to give half that time to the cause of democracy? If printed matter is used, wouldn't it be fair to use half the space for reply? at the expense of the anti-democratic organization. <laughs> if organization meetings refuse to give a hearing to the cause of democracy, wouldn't it be wise to refuse the organization permission to assemble? The instant reply plan may be said to extend the principle of the town meeting of the air to the protection of democracy against anti-democratic propaganda. At a town meeting, any poison you hear from one speaker has a prompt antidote in the next speaker. You will hear at least two antidotes in a moment. <laughs> the instant reply plan is not a plan to repress by censorship, but a plan to meet anti-democratic propaganda by instant discussion. Dynamic democracy must protect public discussion against incitement, and it must meet anti-democratic propaganda by instant reply on the spot, by talking for democracy, and by living democracy, we can use democracy to meet the needs of our own time. Thank you very much, Dr. Laswell. I now take pleasure in welcoming to town hall platform the Honorable J. Parnell Thomas, Republican member of the House of Representatives from the state of New Jersey, Congressman Thomas. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, under the Constitution of the United States, Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to assemble peaceably. Therefore, political groups, even though with alien ties, at least have the right to assemble, but such assemblage must be without disorder. The Municipal Fathers of New York City recognize this constitutional right when they recently granted 
the German-American Bund a permit to assemble in Madison Square Garden. However, when the Bund assembles for the purpose, among others, of advocating and fostering religious intolerance, it tends to incite riot, as a result of which its meeting is not a peaceable assemblage. The performance outside the garden that same evening was clearly a riot caused by another un-American group, the Communists. From what happened inside the hall and from what took place outside of the hall, I would judge that the whole affair was a case of the kettle calling the pot black. The Bund and the Reds are two peas in a pod. They differ only in their method. But the German Amer both the German-American Bund and the Communists, in fact, the Silver Shirts and other newfangled versions of political artistry, have the same aim. They would make over what has taken the citizens of this great nation 150 years to build. They would destroy our democracy in order that we might have a government patterned after some foreign ideology. If they should complete their task, there would be no free press, no free speech, no free religion, no private enterprise, and no individual opportunity. As in Russia, we would be slaves of the common turn, or as in Germany, we would be pawns of a Hitler. I admit, though, that the recent world tide has been away from freedom, that government after government has gone off the reservation, that we have seen one power after another take from the people almost their last vestige of individual liberty. In most nations today, the people are much less free than they were only a few years back. Throughout the entire world, it has become fashionable for the central government to assume more control and more power over its citizenry. I deplore and detest this trend. Even here in the United States, on the question of added centralized power, we have witnessed a disposition of late to get in step with a proletarian or dictator nation. Aided by the silvery toned chief executive, and by the incessant boring from within of the political bureaucrats, the New Deal unequivocally has grasped for everything but for the moon. The court packing plan, the 1938 version of the reorganization bill, and the purge are but some of the examples of the administration's attempted shift. Thanks to the people, Thanks to the people, many of the schemes misfired, so we still have a democratic form of government. We have not yet been carried away by the world tide. Changes in the governmental fashion are in the main caused by economic conditions. If it were not for the prolonged adverse economic conditions here in the United States, political groups with alien ties, such as the German-American Bund and the Communists, would have made little headway. Subversive groups feed on economic adversity. When the economic barometer rises, one is not interested in communism, Nazism, or fascism. Now that we have these un-American groups, however, the question occurs, what should be done about them? Our natural inclination is to forcefully disband them. But this is America, a land of free people and free institutions where individuals and groups of individuals have definite rights given to them by their constitution. If this were Germany or Russia, those who believe who belong to such groups would be quickly incarcerated in detention camps. If you and I were to travel to Russia and Germany and their attempt to form the Russian-American League or the American-German League for Freedom of the Jews, we would not last about 30 seconds. One thing which we can do and which will help some is to ship back all communist aliens and Nazi aliens from whence they came. <laughs> Although even to accomplish this, we must first look for a definite change in the attitude of our present Secretary of Labor and a few of her associates. 
who have not only been coddling outstanding communist aliens, but have suspended the deportation of all communist aliens pending a further clarification of federal statutes. For some years, the Congress of the United States presented a mandate to the Secretary of Labor relating to the deportation of aliens who advocated the overthrow of the government by force and violence. Every Secretary of Labor up to the present one recognized such mandate. Therefore, it is difficult to understand why our present Secretary of Labor should persist in deportation delays. Frances Perkins is to be severely criticized for her dilly-dallying. In addition to existing statutes, which would aid us to curb un-American groups with alien ties, we also need new legislation. I advocate the enactment of legislation which would force these groups into the open. I advocate incorporation and license. I would register and fingerprint the membership. I would make them publish periodical statements of purpose and financial condition. I would see to it that they divulge the source of their funds and a list of their expenses. I would make it necessary for them to publish the salaries of their officers. Such a scrutiny would place them four square before the microscopic eye of public attention. And believe me, I have a tremendous faith in the healing qualities of public opinion. Communism, Nazism, and fascism serve no good purpose in America. So let us make it difficult for them to function. Let us not attempt to limit their constitutional rights, but let us freeze them out of existence. They are un-American political termites whose philosophy is political and economic chaos, social and religious intolerance, and individual and institutional destruction. Surely it is just as important that we protect our form of government, our institutions, and our people from these dangers as it is to protect them from any other, uh, others. We want none of Stalin's New Deal for Russia. We want none of Hitler's New Deal for Germany. Irrespective of what may happen in foreign lands, we in the United States are satisfied to live a peaceful, happy life under a democratic representative government with its guarantee of justice, domestic tranquility, and individual opportunity. And if I judge the people of this nation rightly, they'll not tell, t tolerate very long any ism but Americanism. Further, we intend to preserve America for Americans who believe in the American way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Thomas. It's a good thing we have a good Roosevelt New Dealer on the program tonight. Uh, or we might be accused of unbalancing a program. I take pleasure at this time in presenting one of the commissioners for the Securities Exchange uh, Commission, Mr. Jerome Frank. Mr. Frank. Nazism, fascism, and communism are, of course, alien products. In their native habitats, they are systems at the core of which is dictatorship, resulting in the eradication of all those rights of the individuals and of minorities which democracies take for granted. The Nazi, fascist, and communist philosophies thus of necessity involve the repudiation of democracy. They do not lose their essential anti-democratic character when imported into America. Mere shipment across the salty seas can have no such chemical effect. An ocean voyage does not change a tiger into a house cat. Nazism, fascism, or communism, if successful in America, would thus result in the ultimate overthrow of our democracy. Shall American democracy accord to those foes within the gates the right to preach their doctrines freely? Of course. Otherwise, democracy, in attempting to overcome its internal enemies, would be committing suicide. For... For free speech and free assembly are the vital organs of democracy without which it perishes. Democracy cannot survive by becoming its opposite. Free speech is essential to democracy's defense against its domestic enemies. 
Often, indeed, the mere public expression of anti-democratic purposes will answer itself. Fritz Kuhn's antics served as an anti-toxin against Nazism. The communist and fascist groups each utilize an identical technique to discredit those of us who are opposed to them. If an American condemns communism, the communists shout that he is a fascist. If he attacks fascism, the fascists shout that he is a communist. Thus, they seek to relegate some of us to one group and the rest of us to the other. That is a technique which all of us who are working to preserve democracy must watch carefully and guard against. It is a technique which, if successful, would destroy our effectiveness in resisting alien doctrines and might precipitate another American civil war. Communism is no direct menace to America. We are wedded to the profit system. And therefore, because it is, no, because it is known that communism hopes ultimately to abolish our profit system, it has no chance of success in America, far less chance than fascism. Yet the false fear that the number of American adherents to communism is increasing rapidly may induce some Americans mistakenly to turn in panic as the only answer to communism to some disguised form of fascism, which in fact would, if successful, in the long run, ruin our profit system. A smaller number, frightened by the growth of such reactionary forces, may then turn to communism as the only answer to fascism. It might it be said, indeed, that an ounce of communism produces a pound of fascism. So that if communism is today dangerous to America, it is only indirectly so, as a potential aid to the growth of American fascism and as a possible fomenter of grave national discord. The way out of the dilemma is for liberty-loving Americans to make it plain that our traditional American liberalism has no use for either of these brutalitarian systems, and that by such liberalism alone can we solve America's problems. I am not in any way advocating heresy hunting or the suppression of Nazis, fascists, or communists, nor is what I've said red baiting. Red baiting properly means but two things. First, the effort to deny free speech to communists and their friends. That we must not allow. Second, the dishonest practice employed by fascists and their witting or unwitting aides of using the words communists and reds to vilify all liberals. Such red baiting has its counterpart. We might name it white baiting. I mean the practice of vilifying those liberals who freely criticize the ultimate anti-democratic aims of communism by calling them fascists. Doubtless I shall be dubbed a fascist for what I say tonight. Let us have done with both red and white baiting. In truth, they are red, white, and blue baiting, for they are the devices of those who seek to kill American unity and democracy. We should ridicule this either-or division of Americans into fascists or communists. At least 98% of Americans are neither. They sincerely believe in the necessity of preserving American democracy. The fascists and communists, as I've said, imitate one another's tactics. Of very recent years, communist Earl Browder has absurdly acclaimed Jefferson as in effect an early American communist. <laughs> Fascist Fritz Kuhn, not to be outdone, now hiles George Washington as if he had been a pre-Hitler Fuhrer. <laughs> Each of those anti-American groups tries to divert attention from its own ultimate purposes by attacking the un-Americanism of the other. We mustn't be deceived into an alliance with either. We should unite against the ultimate aims of both. But our united opposition to those aims should be expressed solely in what we say, in how we vote, in running our business and our government to increase the welfare of our citizens, and never in governmental acts of violence or suppression or disfranchisement or other unconstitutional conduct which would be in imitative of the ways of foreign dictators in dealing with minorities. Forced to suppress ideas, we must disavow. But there are acts of force against our tran domestic tran tranquility we should and can constitutionally suppress, and those have been discussed by preceding speakers. 
Finally, our answer to those foreign isms should be in accord with my, what might be called the liberal credo, unreserved loyalty to the Constitution, a constant willingness to contend for the civil rights of all persons, a recognition that a profit system so improved and conducted as to make it efficient, an independent property-owning middle class, and vital farm and labor movements are essential to our democracy and to the well-being of all Americans. Thorough awareness that the best safeguard for America is a very widely diffused American prosperity inside democracy. Unhesitating adherence at all times to the position that the retention of our priceless heritage of American democracy requires opposition to anti-democratic foreign isms, whether of the open or camouflaged Nazi, fascist, or communist varieties. Thank you, Mr. Frank. We pause now for station identification. Continuing America's town meeting of the air in town hall in New York City, discussing the subject, should we limit the rights of political groups with alien ties? We've heard three extremely thought-provoking and useful discussion, uh, presentations on this question, and now we're ready for the question period. Will members of the audience who want to ask questions please rise and state the name of the person to whom that question is directed? Questions, please. Mr. Frank. Frank, I want to ask you, in reference to your statement of disbelief in governmental violence, whether or not you believe in the enforcement of the existing federal law known as the Sedition Law and our New York State Law, probably misnomered but very specific, as the Criminal Anarchy Law. Do you believe in the enforcement of our existing laws against those who advocate violence in the destruction of our government. I, be I believe in the enforcement of any laws which are constitutional. What? constitutional. I, I'm not prepared to discuss the question of the constitutionality of the statutes to which you refer. If they are valid, and so long as they are in the books, they should be enforced. There is a question, however, of constitutionality as well as of public policy as to which great minds have differed, and I shall only at this moment refer you to the fact that the difference as to where one should draw the line was a matter about some, which some of our greatest justices of the Supreme Court in not very distant years disagreed. I refer, for instance, to the dissenting opinions of Mr. Justice Holmes on several of the free speech and the espionage cases. propaganda and incitement, propaganda being lawful when in the exercise of free speech, and incitement unlawful. Now, I should like you, if you please, to apply that distinction to the rally at Madison Square Garden, where, as one of the speakers said, there was no question but what it incited riots outside. When is a meeting propaganda, and when is it incitement? That's the I think I indicated that the, by the term incitement that I had meant, acts which interfered with free discussion. Now, I think it would be extremely difficult for anybody to demonstrate successfully that free discussion requires some of the situations which we have permitted in the United States. I indicated in my previous remarks that I felt that it was extremely important to perform, to insist, that acts of incitement should be dealt with, with the, by the full vigor of the state. I feel that we should understand that by the term propaganda, we mean the use of words and word substitutes as means of trying to convince other people that we're sound. I would certainly insist that we should have no interference with propaganda in this country, but we should certainly, by the measures which I've indicated, use all the powers of the state to insist that there should be no act of incitement in the sense of interferences with free discussion. Uh, Congressman Thomas, would you comment on that question? 
how you feel about the difference between the right of propaganda and the distinction between propaganda and incitement. The gentleman in the audience referred to the meeting at Madison Square Garden. I believe he referred to my remark in relation to that meeting. There's no question but what one of the purposes of the meeting was by the direct methods used by the Bund speakers to bring about religious hatred. There was no question but what they incited riot. And my guess is, in that case, it could be even the incitement of riot and propaganda both. Thank you, sir. Next question. Mr. Thomas, sir. the distinguished New Deal speakers we had here tonight opposes <laughs> communism and Nazism. Do you know of any instances where members of his administration have spoken before fascistic or Nazi <coughs> meetings, or where any of them have spoken before communist meetings? I know of no instance where a member of the New Deal family has spoken before a Nazi meeting or a fascist meeting, but I know of 12 instances where members of the New Deal family have spoken before communist front organization conventions. I'm afraid we're getting a little out of order here. Uh, now, uh, that the question is, should we limit the rights of political group with groups with alien ties? Uh, I'm going to ask you to stick to that subject, and if Mr. Frank wants to comment on the first, on that question, he's at liberty to do so. I would like to say that I would like to, nothing better in the world than to address a Nazi or a fascist meeting. Once in a while, the best way to catch a thief is to use a thief, to use a slang expression, as an investigator. I'm going to ask you again to keep uh, personalities out of this insofar as we possibly can. The only reason we could permit that question is because the man has been up before a public committee. I suppose that's uh, permissible on that basis. Uh, the gentleman in the balcony, yes? Mr. Moderator, would you have Senator Thomas answer the thesis of Mr. Frank, who pointed out that a restriction on freedom of speech is incompatible with a democracy? Uh, I'm sure that Congressman Thomas is uh, complimented by your promoting him to a senator. Congressman <laughs> 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 Thomas, the question is, would you uh, comment on uh, what the previous speaker says about restrictions on freedom of speech being incompatible with our democracy. I very firmly believe that our Constitution is very specific on the question of freedom of speech. And there's no question in my mind but what we have a as strong a law as we can possibly make, allowing almost everyone, and perhaps everyone, the right of freedom of speech. The man on the last row in the balcony, yes? Uh, <laughs> Quiet, please. Is not the enforcement of such regulations upon aliens, as you suggest, in itself a form of fascist arbitrary, arbitrary rule easily extended? Now, what was that first very long word that you gave? <laughs> arbitrary law. Arbitrarily rule. This isn't what you suggested you by way of restriction. Again? This is what you suggested by way of restriction, uh, a fascist tendency in itself. 
I think that's the purpose of the question. No, I don't think so. I think that we should bring these un-American movements right out in the open. And one way of doing that is by registering them, by fingerprinting them, by uh, taking, uh, keeping track of their membership, their receipts, and their outgo, and also by knowing at all times the purpose of the organization. Next question. Mr. Frank. Mr. Frank. I'd like to know what uh, Mr. Frank thinks of the suggestion of one of the previous speakers to have communistic and fascistic groups in this country divulge the source of their funds and the salary of their chief officers. Frank, what about that suggestion? I haven't thought about it very carefully. What casual thought I've given to it makes me think that perhaps there's something in it. We have a, a law that requires those who are selling stocks and bonds of corporations to tell the truth about the corporations and their affiliations. We might possibly apply the same to ideas. The young lady. Mr. Thomas. Thomas, don't right, you think right. that the grasping of any opportunity to vilify the president through the New Deal, even though uh, not apropos of the question of the meeting, gives our Nazi friends license to do the same? I think that you're very right. I think we shouldn't vilify the president of the United States at any meeting. Uh, where's that uh, question over there in the balcony? Yes? Congressman Thomas. Yes, sir. <laughs> you speak about the Constitution, Congressman. Would you say United States Senator Mahoney and Norman Thomas ostensibly came to Jersey City to create violence? Under the so-called guise of protecting Americanism, a riot was precipitated on the part of Jersey City authorities. What guarantee have we got that the state, the, that the state, the government, so to speak, when the guys are protecting Americanism, will not assume perhaps fascistic tendencies and outlying liberals or radicals, for that matter, to speak their bit? In other words, what proof yeah, have we right, got? That's right. what I first said in Jersey City several months ago. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, I want to say first that that city is under democratic control. I'm a Republican. <laughs> but I do believe that any assembly which incites or tends to incite riot is absolutely wrong. I don't know very much about the meeting that you refer to, but I do know that this particular meeting... In New, York, in New York City, where the German-American Bund met inside and the communists met outside, there was no question but what there was incitement of riot at that meeting. Thank you. The lady back on the Who's this to? I'm sorry, question. To who? To who? Mr. Maxwell. Or the disguised American fascists, such as the Silver Shirts and Crusaders, have made anything like the headway they have if it wasn't for constant appeal, not only to foolish anti-Jewish prejudice, sometimes anti-Catholic prejudice, but to proxy prejudice, such as we have heard tonight, and, mm -hmm. and attacks as read on everything attended to help the underdog. I think that question calls simply for a reaffirmation of the point which was made by Mr. Frank. The point was that it is extremely important in public discussion in a democracy for public figures to refrain from that form of red baiting which consists in the promiscuous pinning of a red label on a liberal person. Thank you. 
But uh, what are we to do with people who we cannot point our finger at? We cannot say whether he's a fascist or a communist. How we give that to people to fly? <laughs> lady likes your plan, Professor Laszlo, but she wants to know how to enforce it, make it effective right away. Well, I think that's an extremely interesting question because I said nothing about the practical ways by which the particular objectives could be accomplished. I believe it's very clear that it would be necessary to have a clear understanding of what it is that we're going to mean by, demo by democracy. We can define some acts of anti-democratic incitement, some kinds of anti-democratic propaganda in a clear statute. I think it is very reasonable for us, even in times of crisis, to look forward to the possibility of having what you may uh, speak of as instant reply boards. After all, in time of warfare and crisis, we take it for granted that it's a very sensible idea to call on our citizens to lose their lives for democracy. Now, I'm perfectly willing to suggest that American citizens should have an opportunity directly in times of peace to defend the principles of democracy directly, face to face, in the presence of those who dare attack those principles. Uh, the unaffordable awareness, unawareness, of the meeting held in Jersey City, the state which you represent, and also the unavoidable lack of knowledge about your own attack upon the President of the United States tonight. Oh. No, no, I'm sorry. No, that question now. No, but I'm sorry, Congressman. We can't have personal. We can't have personal questions. Sit down, please. Next question. The gentleman here who's asking a question. Next question. Next. No. Next question. Yes. Let's have Congressman Thomas back. All right. <laughs> Yesterday was my great privilege, as the day before, to listen to the Senate gallery in Washington to a discussion on the reorganization bill. Does the congressman not think if the members of his party, the same as the other people who opposed the president, cooperated with him in the mandate that the American public gave him to uh, adjust our economic problems, that we wouldn't necessarily have to be here tonight discussing the problem that we are discussing? <laughs> no, that question also is out of order. That's in another field. We must stick to the subject. Next question. Is this for Congressman Thomas? Thomas, I feel that the yes. uh, alien philosophies are advancing very rapidly because of the insecurity of many people. Of course, our, I believe our leaders and our politicians are doing a very poor job because the have-nots, or I'd rather call them the dissatisfied people, are growing rather than decreasing. Now, what can be done in dem by democratic agencies to decrease the number of dissatisfied people that increase these philosophies, these alien philosophies. Well, you've related your question to the subject very nicely. All right, Congressman. <laughs> I, think, I think the gentleman has asked a very good question. There's no question but what that we, we want to improve our economic conditions. One way to improve our economic conditions is to improve business. And one way to improve business is by our administration and the Congress passing the kind of laws which will be beneficial to business. Congressman Thomas, please. <laughs> Let's stay by me. Congressman, have you a scrupulous cataloging and fingerprinting of our bad aliens? I'm sure it would be a very delightful pastime. <laughs> but exactly who is to decide who is a Nazi or who is a communist or who is a fascist? Exactly where and how are you going to draw that line of demarcation between a good alien and a bad one? I don't think that we should draw the line between a good alien and a bad one until we have passed laws which would be very specific on the subject. And at the present time, we haven't got enough laws on the subject. That's why I advocated new legislation along the lines that I did mention. No. What are you going to use as your criterion of a good alien and a bad one? Well, if we pass a law and it says that such and such a person 
shouldn't do such and such a thing, and he does it, he's a bad one. to do that some other evening. I don't think it's germane to our discussion tonight. I think you know the answer. Uh, next question. This question is for Mr. Jerome Frank. <laughs> Mr. Frank, <laughs> do you approve the existence of the private army, the peacekeeping military gangsters of Fritz Kuhn? And should it be permitted to continue in America? <laughs> I think that when persons with anti-democratic attitudes form private armies or private police forces, they are transcending their rights under the Constitution. And that if we do not have appropriate laws to prevent that sort of thing, such laws should be enacted. I think that it, we need not allow enemies of our democracy to arm themselves for some future attempted revolution against our government. Well, we've gotten Congressman Thomas and Mr. Frank together on one point. Now, next question. Uh, when Mr. Thomas tell me why representatives of groups called Alien by the Dars Committee were not allowed to go to Washington at their own expense to answer such accusations, the gentleman is, is very wrong. The Dives Committee invited all those who had been attacked by any witnesses to come before the Dives Committee or to submit affidavits to the Dives Committee denying the allegations that have been made. Thank you, sir. The lady. Why are we quite so anxious to define that line? as to the alien thoughts and those who are not aliens, instead of a defensive program, why don't we have a little bit more aggressive program in showing what the comparative wages, working conditions, living conditions, <coughs> the isms are offering one thing, let it be shown exactly what is going on in the ism country, and let it be comparatively shown what they are receiving in this country, perhaps some of those that would be on one side of the line <coughs> might come over to the right side. <laughs> it's interesting, but I'm not sure I quite understand it. Well, she wants to know why we don't have a more aggressive program in this country of fighting alien propaganda by showing the difference between the economic level in this country and the economic level in the other countries. That's the question. I, my answer is I don't know. Certainly we ought to. Sir, I thought we had been doing it. Uh, that's exactly my notion of an antidote for alien isms. It is not to suppress the speakers, but to answer their ideas. Well, who would you have do that, for instance? You say we. Who would you have do that? Let's get practical. Well, why not you? <laughs> why not you? Well, why not? <laughs> uh, gentlemen here, please. Mr. Frank. Do you believe Dr. Laswell's instant reply plan is a restriction on free speech and free assembly? Not if I understand it. It's quite in line with it. I can't see that free speech is denied by being replied to instantly. I don't know why a delay makes it free speech and instant <laughs> reply doesn't. Uh, <laughs> young man in the center of the ballot. Yes. Uh, the from New Jersey. <laughs> you suggested in your address tonight that we deport all undesirable aliens. What assurance have you got that the various countries to which we want to deport the aliens will accept them or would you want, or would you want them to wander mercilessly upon the world? as the brown-shirted monster in Germany is doing to his minority. 
In the first... In the first place, I didn't say to deport undesirable aliens. That wasn't, those weren't the words I used. While the ones I would deport are undesirable in my mind, however, that's communist aliens and Nazi aliens, those were the words I used. There's no question but what if we deported a person now to Germany, that he would be deported. There's no question but what if we deported a person now to Russia, he would be deported. The job that we have before us, however, is to get the Labor Department to deport anybody. into the homes of aliens to teach them democracy. I don't quite know what is intended by that question. If I might use that question as an excuse to emphasize a certain point which I think ought to be stressed, which is that we can go much farther than we have gone in the United States in defense of a dynamic program. I think this country lacks the positive program of democratic propaganda that it ought to have. the carrying of arms as incitement. I regard the carrying of arms as incitement. It definitely should be stopped. As far as tenderness toward propaganda, that's laid down as I understand it in our Constitution. Thank you very much, Professor Laszlo. I'm sorry that our meeting seems to be drawing to a close with a great many people on their feet. Unfortunately, the subject is endless and will be continued in the discussion groups throughout the country and doubtless by many of you after you've left the hall. Will you please keep your seats now until we announce the program for the next two weeks. Mr. Cross, will you tell us about next week's program? Next week at this hour, America's town meeting of the air will originate from a point other than Town Hall, New York, for the second time this season. The program will be broadcast as a special feature of the Institute of Human Relations which is meeting at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And the subject, echoing President Roosevelt's phraseology, is this. Is the South our number one economic problem? The speakers, Senator Josiah W. Bailey of North Carolina, Chairman of the Senate Claims Committee, and member of the Finance and Commerce Committee. Dr. Frank Porter Graham, President of the University of North Carolina, Vice Chairman of the National Consumers Advisory Board and Chairman of the National Advisory Council on Social Security, and John Rust, one of the famous Rust Brothers of Memphis, Tennessee, inventors of the mechanical cotton picker. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Now, here's a special announcement. In preparation for our program for April 6th, we are taking our radio audience into partnership. The topic to be discussed on that evening is, Can Europe Escape War Now? The program will be a symposium, and this is where we ask your participation. During the first half hour of that program, we want the, to answer questions relating to this topic, which our radio audience and discussion groups want to have answered. In other words, the whole American public. The first half of that program will therefore be given over to having our speakers answer questions prepared, selected by those sent in from anywhere in the country. 
The last half hour will be given over to answering the questions from our audience here in town hall as usual. If you have a question, therefore, relating to this subject that is in the minds of all of us today, can Europe escape war now? Send it to the program committee, the town hall, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. And we'll try to have it answered for you on that program on April 6th. Now, our speakers on that occasion will be Mr. Raymond Clapper, famous correspondent of the World Telegram and other Scripps Howard newspapers, Mr. S.K. Ratcliffe, town hall lecturer and authority on international affairs, Raymond Graham Swing, radio commentator, Dr. Frederick L. Schumann of Williams College, and Mr. John Gunther, the author of Inside Europe. Remember... We are relying on you, the members of our radio audience, to make that program one of the best of the year. We want to make it your program, and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Now, Mr. Cross, will you tell us about obtaining copies of tonight's program? Every week, the full program of America's Town Meeting of the Air, including all speeches, questions, and answers, is published by Columbia University Press in a magazine called Town Meeting. Copies are 10 cents each, a nominal charge to cover printing and handling, while subscriptions to the entire series of 26 issues, including the back numbers so far this year, cost $2.50. They may be obtained by sending your order to Town Hall, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. Town Hall, 123 West 43rd Street, New York City. Is the South our number one economic problem? Now, Neaton, this is the National Broadcasting Company.